I'm uh, Dr. Margaret Bowman. Uh, I'm a neurologist at the Boston University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I'm delighted to be here this morning to be able to speak to you all about my experiences with the autistic population. Uh, I see both children, adults, and adolescents on the spectrum, and uh, have had about 35 years worth of experience uh, with this population. Uh, what, we, what I'd like to speak to you about this morning is some of the physical comorbidities that go along with this disorder. And most of our therapies are geared towards behavior management, speech and language, occupational therapy, teaching social skills, uh, and uh, for the older group, uh, vocational uh, intervention. But coming along with that is the fact that many of them will present with behavioral issues, which up to this point have been traditionally seen as simply part of the autism story. And in fact, as we've learned over the past five to 10 years, this is not the case. That certainly autistic people can have unusual behaviors, but many of these behaviors can give it be a signal for some kind of underlying physical condition. The problem is that children on the autism spectrum, as well as adolescents and adults, do not present with the usual symptoms that most specialists would recommend or, or would be able to recognize uh, easily as being medical in origin. So for example, uh, we have a number of disorders that we are concerned about. We know that individuals on the autism spectrum are uh, likely to have a seizure disorder. Appro approximately one third of individuals with autism have seizures. Not all those seizures are always obvious to uh, the, the uh, provider. They may look like staring spells or they may look like some unusual uh, repetitive behavior. Uh, so that is an area that is easily identified and treatable and really could make a substantial difference in the life of the patient. Secondly, sleep disorders are very common. Uh, that too can look like a behavioral problem, but could be related to, for example, big tonsils and adenoids, which don't allow the patient to breathe well and therefore keeps them awake. Or it could be to secondary to some kind of gastrointestinal problem, what's called reflux, where gastric acids come up into the back of the throat and keep someone awake or wake them up in the middle of the night. And then there are hormonal issues. There are teenage girls, for example, uh, who are, are experiencing some hormonal imbalance, which causes them uh, distress, particularly around the time of their menstrual periods. And then on top of that, there are younger children who can have gastrointestinal, uh, sorry, can have genitourinary problems, uh, which um, can exhibit themselves as uh, uh, urinary accidents. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, seem to be doing, being as toilet trained as they had been before and start having uh, accidents for no apparent reason. That's been identified by a subgroup of individuals as being a spastic bladder, which is treatable. And then one of the larger areas of concern is gastrointestinal dysfunctions. Uh, they, this could be almost any kind of gastrointestinal problem, including constipation, diarrhea, gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophagitis, and so forth, all of which can cause some significant distress uh, to the patient. Now, one of the problems that we get into is the fact that many of our patients are nonverbal or hypoverbal, and they can't tell us that they don't feel well. And so one of the ways that they manifest some of this discomfort is by uh, having uh, unusual behaviors. And if I could just give an example of a young woman who came to see me at the age of 21, she was hitting her head and the one thing that she could say was head hurts. And it was repetitive and it was over and over again. And her parents brought her in because they were convinced that she was having headaches. And my suggestion was to begin, to begin with, was to refer her to a gastroenterologist, even though she had no obvious gastrointestinal symptoms. And the reason for that is that the gastrointestinal disorders are common enough that this certainly needs to be one of the first areas of investigation in almost any patient on the spectrum who presents with some unusual behaviors. 
In any case, she went off to see the gastroenterologist, had some procedures done, was diagnosed as having esophagitis and gastritis. She was treated appropriately and the, the repetitive behaviors and head hurts stopped. I think one of the other challenges is that many individuals on the spectrum have sensory problems and they cannot act e easily identify even where the discomfort is. At another conference where I spoke, uh, I had a young woman who was clearly very bright and very verbal, came up to me after my presentation and said, you know, it takes me about, when I get sick, it takes me about three days to figure out what's wrong with me. And this is a very bright, verbal person who is having trouble even deciding what the problem is when she doesn't feel well. So this is a huge challenge for uh, any individuals on the spectrum and for those people who would take care of them. So even if you had someone who, who is verbal, uh, they might not be able to accurately tell you uh, what is going on. In addition to my clinical work, I also do uh, research. There have been at least two search situations where the individuals have, been, have died because of a ruptured appendix that was not diagnosed or picked up and they, were, they presented with behavioral problems, but nobody recognized that this was a healthcare issue. They simply took it as part of the person's autism. The patient was not treated and ultimately passed away. So this is exact, in fact, a, a significant area of concern and uh, just underlines the fact that individuals on the spectrum who demonstrate behavioral problems absolutely merit a good physical medical uh, workup. And all of us have to learn the signs and signals, if you will, of discomfort in uh, nonverbal individuals uh, who can't communicate uh, how they feel. The, the advantage of being able to evaluate these individuals is the fact that if you, if you can help them feel better, they're going to do better and they will have better outcomes. And this has absolutely been the case in all of the individuals that I've seen and we've diagnosed with some kind of healthcare issue. It could be ear infections, it could be uh, somebody broke uh, their bone and didn't be able to tell anyone about it. Uh, it could be uh, 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 metabolic disorders, it could be gastrointestinal symptoms, it could be almost anything. But if we're not good at identifying it and treating it, then we're not going to be able to help these individuals as well as we could. So I, it's our strong recommendation at this point that that's providers who are familiar with individuals on the autism spectrum need to be recruited to work with these families and these uh, patients in order to provide the interventions that they need that will allow them the best outcomes. Uh, there, this has been a huge uh, area of concern here in the United States and continues to be a challenge, uh, I'm sure, across the world. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak here today. I hope the comments that I've made have been helpful. And if anyone has any questions, I certainly would be happy to hear from you, uh, either by email or by some other means in the future. I would be more than happy to clarify my comments. Thank you so very much, and I hope it's been helpful.